Okay, well, welcome in to episode eight of Success Sessions with the Impact Project. Name is Allie Pruitt. Um, for those who don't know me already, this session is about um, careers in civil rights, public interest, and government work. And we are so excited to be joined by a fantastic panel. Um, my guy TJ is on. TJ, I can't see you, but I, I know you're there. So um, we will get started with all of our um, introductions and then hop into questions. So to all of our incredible panelists, we'll just go one by one um, and asking you all to just introduce yourself, stating where you went to law school, um, what kind of work you do, and you know maybe your career path from law school so we'll start uh, with Zadi Cannon. Hi everyone, my name is Shazadi Cannon. I went to USC John Marshall. I graduated in December 2019. Um, luckily I was able to graduate a semester early. I started as a Cook County Public Defender in July of 2020. Um, so it was just a couple months after I was licensed. I was licensed about a year ago, um, so May 2020. Um, I've always been interested in public interest work. I've always wanted to be a Cook County Public Defender. I knew I wanted to be a Cook County Public Defender when I was 17 years old. So this is obviously my dream job. Um, of course, I'll eventually want to do something different. Probably, maybe, I have no idea, but I know that I'll always want to do public interest work. I'll always want to work for um, lower income families. So yeah, that's pretty much um, my career path. Awesome, awesome. Um, Mr. Allen, if you could please introduce yourself for us. Oh, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Shay Allen. Excuse my background. I'm actually in court, so I stepped out. Uh, court ran a lot longer than I expected today. Um, but so like I said, I'm Shay Allen. Uh, I went to Howard to law school a million years ago. I'm probably a, the, the old man here. Um, while in law school, I clerked for the um, Public Defender Service in D.C., I clerked for the uh, attorney general in DC, but I ended up coming back to Chicago uh, where I'm from. And I was a Cook County uh, state's attorney, prosecutor for uh, five and a half years or so. Um, then after that, uh, I worked for a boutique law firm where I did plaintiffs, mostly plaintiffs, um, med mal and personal injury work. And then for the last, uh, almost 10 years or so, I've had my own firm uh, where I focus on uh, civil rights and criminal defense. And uh, so then that's what I'm doing right now. I'm actually um, helping a client out over here on the west side of Chicago uh, with, with the case today. Great, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have to hop off to walk back into court or anything, let us know. Totally fine. Um, I love the background. It's much better than any of ours. At least you're outside in this end time. So no problem at all. Just let us know. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and now, last but not least, the assistant district attorney in New York City. We're so excited to have you uh, join us. I know the time zone's a bit different. A little early this morning, but if you could introduce yourself for us, please. Hi guys, I'm Che Van Air. I also went to UIC John Marshall. Um, I graduated class of 2020, May 2020. Um, I took the bar exam, the first online bar exam ever, um, which was actually on a different time as well. It was in October. So it was kind of a crazy time. Um, I found that I passed it, thank God. And I um, started working very shortly after I took it as an assistant attorney in New York City. Um, when I was in John Marshall, I always knew I wanted to do criminal law. I did not know I wanted to be a prosecutor until I ended up falling into it. I ended up clerking for a judge for two summers over in the, the suburbs of New York City, and he was a public defender for quite some time. Uh, and then I found out I ended up working for the state's attorney, um, Kim Fox, as a, my internship, well, externship for John Marshall. And that's when I found out that I had a lot more um, interest in prosecution than I thought. And then I ended up getting hired by the DA in um, New York City and I've been working there ever since. Awesome, well again, thank you all so much to all of our panelists for coming in. TJ and I are thrilled to have you guys for our season finale. Um, no better way to go out than talking with those who 
are working on the ground and in some great public interest work. So uh, first question that we'll pose to all of you today, I know some of you kind of touched on your journey a little bit into why you wanted to. I know Zadi said this was your dream job since you were 17 and Jay, you're talking about kind of falling into it. Um, and attorney Allen, who, who has done kind of run the gambit and done a lot of um, things in the legal profession. So first question I, I posed to you all is what propelled you to do work in sort of this general sector of, um, you know, public interest, government, civil rights work? Um, and if you want to touch on specifically why you chose one area or the other, that's great. But just in general, um, especially knowing that that sort of work is very different from working in a firm, which is very different from working in house and those sorts of things. So generally this sector, what attracted you to it um, and made you want to start your career, or, you know, end your career in sort of that area? We can start um, with Zadia here. So um, actually when I was uh, the summer going into my senior year of high school, John Marshall Law actually hosted like a little high school two week full time program um, that they let you be in the life of a lawyer. I don't remember all the details, but you have to stay at John Marshall every day for two weeks for eight hours. And they brought us a bunch of lawyers in and it was a great networking opportunity too before I even knew what networking was. And one of my friends who was a part of the program, his mom was a Cook County Public Defender. And at that time she was in the juvenile division. So I became close to their family and she would tell me about her work and all these lawyers would come in over the two weeks and it was like the, the, the lawyer, the in-house counsel for Walmart. And there was like an attorney for a, a recording agency and everybody made so much money. And I was like, no, but the Cook County Public Defender seems spicy. And I was like, they have to make a lot of money probably because you know they're government employees. And I was like, so I'll just go with the spicy route that makes a lot of money. And then in college, I found out that actually government employees don't make a whole bunch of money. And it's actually the exact opposite. And that Cook County Public Defenders are super underappreciated. And I learned more about, you know, that it wasn't the life that I thought that it was. All the spiciness came with more stress than I thought that I could handle. So going into law school, my 1L year, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm still gonna try it out. And you know, um, the mother of my friend reached back out to me and was like, you know, do you want to do this um, in, this uh, internship at the Cook County Public Defender for your first summer? So I was like, uh, I'll, I'll see. Let me see what it's paying. And I found out they didn't pay anything. And then I got offered an in-house position that was paying me for my work. So I was like, I don't know if the public defender is for me, you know. And so I went in-house. I, I externed for an appellate court justice. I worked for firms. I did moot court, I did everything I possibly could throughout law school. And finally I decided, you know, I'm gonna try the Cook County Public Defender because that's what I initially wanted to do. And, you know, my family was telling me money isn't everything and being underappreciated, that's maybe what the media portrays, but your clients are gonna appreciate you. So I, I ended up trying out the Cook County Public Defender and it was the most unique experience I've ever had they put me in court, they had me in front of the judge. I did more for the Cook County Public Defender than I did for any other position that had paid me for my time. And so I realized that it was, and I, I got to meet a lot of clients and a lot of, from backgrounds that I'm familiar with and a lot of people that deserve representation that just, they just couldn't get it. They, they couldn't, the only reason why they were in such a crappy situation some of them at least was because they just weren't in a position to do something better for their lives. And I realized that, you know, everybody's background is different. And that's when it really sunk in that everybody deserves adequate representation, no matter what their situation is. So I applied for the Cook County Public Defender in my last semester. Um, I was preparing for the bar exam. I took the bar exam and I was, I, you know, I had applied for the public defender. I had done interviews, the pandemic had hit. The interviews were being like turning to Zoom. My interviews went way worse than I thought that they would. And I saw I applied for a bunch of different positions. And finally, last minute, the Cook County Public Defender reached out to me in July and was like, you know, you did get the job. It's just because of the pandemic, everything was slowed down. And I had I was also working for a firm at the time. And so I was like, you know, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna wait for this firm to offer me in a position where I know that they're gonna, you know. They're gonna eventually give me a certain lifestyle 
or am I gonna do the work that I actually had fun doing? So I just took the leap of faith and I quit my job and I started with the public defender. And when I started, they did not make me an attorney, even though I was a licensed attorney, they did not have me as a, an assistant public defender. And eventually I got to the assistant public defender position in about September. And I've loved it ever since. I, I love the public defender's office. I think all of the stress is worth it. Every single um, tear that I shed for my clients is worth it. All the times I feel like I'm failing somebody, but I know that I'm actually helping them, it's worth it. And I can't see myself doing another job that's not similar to this. That's so amazing. And um, maybe some of you know, I clerked with Dottie just in a different division at the PD's office. And I tell so many folks that if you're interested in, in getting thrown into the fire, the PD's office is a great place to go. I remember my attorney saying, okay, you're going to argue in court today. And I'm like, are you sure? You know, so um, would love to, to delve into more of your experience there, Zadi. But um, Che, I know you mentioned that you didn't necessarily know that you had an interest in a prosecutor work at first. So if you could touch on, you know, your interest in the sector in general and, and how you decided that the prosecutor role was the right role for you. Yeah, so I've always wanted to work in the public sector. Um, I studied politics in college. I always liked being on the ground with people. Um, I wanted to be a public defender for quite a while. Um, and then I realized that I needed something that was going to give me a little bit more control. Um, and I feel like that's what the, um, the district attorney's office gave me. Um, you know, we get like a really bad rap going, you know, especially being a person of color, being a prosecutor. So I definitely had to like come to terms with that personally. Um, within myself while I was doing the job. But uh, ever since I've started, I have not regretted it. I love my job. I'm always in court. I'm always, you know, working with other ADAs and other people. I'm always talking to people, um, even though it is over Zoom, which is actually really sad because I really miss going to office so much. I have probably been in the office two or three times since I started working here. And it's been um, about six months. So the pandemic has been really rough on the legal profession for sure. Um, but it's, you know, it definitely hits different. Like, just like Zadi has her clients, you know, I have mine, you know, um, people who are victims of crime are the average everyday person, you know, the person who was walking to the subway, who got mugged, the woman who was, you know, at a party who got raped, the people who are just, you know, minding their own business, who are traumatized, who their whole life is disturbed because of something that happened to them. And justice may not necessarily always mean incarceration. Justice means what's best for the community, you know, whether it be restorative justice, whether it be a drug court program, whether it be probation, or whether it be incarceration for someone who was killed or murdered or whatever it was, you know. So um, the best part about working for New York City is we are one of the most liberal cities in the nation. So our prosecution is um, we take a lot of things into, um, I guess, into account when we make our decisions. Um, we're not out to lock anybody up. I mean, if you need to be locked up, you will. But the real thing is we're trying to make what's best for everybody. So in terms of like what I'm doing, I'm very proud of what I'm doing. Um, I enjoy what I'm doing. And I think it's a it's sometimes a thankless profession. But you know, you're you're always pretty much same thing as Adi. You're always in the fire. You know, you have to always be on your feet. You have to think quickly sometimes. Sometimes you might get a status sheet that sucks. Sometimes you might not have the file you need. Sometimes you might get a nasty judge. You know, there's a bunch of different things that can come into effect that you have to learn how to bend to every day. Um, but like I said, you're working with the average everyday person. And the best part is when you get that thank you, you know, thank you for helping me with my case. Thank you for, you know, make, getting me the justice I deserve. Thank you for getting me that drug program I refuse to go to, you know, so I do like it a lot um, and I'm networking a bunch. I'm meeting so many different people from, you know, uh, both sides, both prosecution, meeting a bunch of great defense attorneys. And we're not really enemies like people think, at least not in New York City, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of cool with each other. I mean, you do have some people who take it too seriously, but you know, at the end of the day is it's my career and uh, we're both fighting just for the people. So I definitely really love my job. And I think that if you want to, you know, be, be in public interest, then maybe you should look into prosecution. 
Awesome, awesome. And I think TJ will delve in with you guys about what your day to day is like and sort of the tasks that you do, because I think there's a misconception there as well. But last but not least, um, Mr. Allen, I know you mentioned that you um, did a lot of clerkships in law school that were in the public interest realm, but then um, did some personal injury work and things like that. So what about the sector and doing um, criminal defense work and civil rights work attracted you to that area? Um, yeah, so uh, I started out uh, my career 15 years ago. So times, times were different. <laughs> uh, I started out as a prosecutor here in Chicago, uh, where I'm from. Um, but I think the public view and concept, well, not, not I think it, it was, it was very different than it is now. Uh, the, the view has moved much towards, much more towards restorative justice than it was back then. Back then, the focus was much more on uh, punishment, uh, and not, I don't think, rehabilitation. Uh, it's, it's still, uh, I think there's still a lot of focus on that, but it's starting to get more positive in regards to just uh, what's best for the community. So with that in mind, when I started out as a state's attorney, my goal was much like the other gentleman on HA, um, that I thought that as a person of color, as a person from uh, the Roseland neighborhood in Chicago, which is has a bad reputation, it's a, it's a great neighborhood, though, a bad reputation, um, that I could uh, better serve victims, maybe make some uh, positive policy changes in office. But what ended up happening, sorry to say, you know, I'm gonna speak like old man here, sorry to say that um, that didn't occur. The higher I got up in office, the more I felt like uh, I was fighting a battle by myself. Um, so I ended up leaving and thought I could be better served or better serve the community on the defense side as a criminal defense attorney. Um, and then over the years as a criminal defense attorney, I found that many of my clients came to me with uh, civil rights issues. Uh, you know, the officer used excessive force. There was a uh, search warrant executed at the wrong residence, you know, all these types of issues. So um, soon after that, I started where well, I said, well, I'll start uh, doing these cases because they seem to intersect. Um, and uh, so I started getting into uh, civil rights cases, uh, mostly in federal court. Um, I've been doing it ever since, but, and mostly because those two avenues kind of intersected, the, the civil rights portion of it and the, uh, the criminal defense portion of it. Uh, and I, I think those two, unfortunately, go hand in hand more often than not. So I wanted to be able to offer, offer both of those um, services to my clients. Um, and then I've always wanted to work in public interest as well. Um, I, I've run for office here in Chicago. Uh, and I, I knew always, I, I went to law school and undergrad away from Chicago, but I knew I was going to always come back to try to improve the city. And uh, public interest is, I think, the way you're going to do that. Uh, of course, people want to going to want to work at law firms, that's fine. Um, but I think the way you really are going to impact your city is uh, through uh, public interest. Thank you guys for that. Um, and one thing I want to say, can we normalize glorifying public interest attorneys, man, because I hear far too often it's big law or nothing. And I kind of really hate that stigma. Um, Zadi, Che and, and, and Mr. Allen, I think you guys are truly doing God's work and really helping the hands of people that actually need the help. Um, you know, a lot of people from my community are affected by you know, some of the injustices that go on in this country. And, you know, to have you guys in those positions, especially people of color, is very uh, rewarding, not only for myself, but I know that the community is being served well. And we need we need more people of color to kind of continue that path of going into public interest and really serving their community. Um, and we should somehow normalize you guys getting more money because you deserve it. Uh, you, you work just as hard as anybody in big law. You work endless hours. Um, I believe that the emotional barriers are a lot more uh, strenuous on uh, public interest attorneys as well, because it's a, bit, it's a lot more personal. So, you know, I want to just thank you guys for the work that you guys do and, and continue to keep up the good fight and, um, and, and thank you. So, um, which leads me to the next question of like, what's your guys' day to day like in your current role and, and what's the hardest part of the job and the most rewarding part? We'll start with Che. 
Okay, so on my day to day, so I'm in an interesting unit actually, because um, so how it is here, we don't get, we didn't get sworn in right away. So like the waiting process to get sworn in was forever. So we do like, um, we kind of like are still in training half and half and then ha half we're doing like our job. So my day to day is when I'm not, the most interesting part, well, I'll tell you about is obviously court and you know, arraignment, you guys know how that goes. So I'm not gonna really delve too much into that. But um, which is basically just talking to the judge, you know, making sure that all the files are correct um, and so on and so forth. So um, well, my more interesting job is when I'm in the complaint room. That's when I pretty much control what goes on for that day. So I'll, I'll my shift will be nine to five, or three to 11, whatever it is. Um, I will call the complaint room and I'll say, this is ADA Van Air. I'm checking in today, I'm ready for cases. So they say, okay. And they'll give me a case number. I'll, I'll go into, um, BXDA, district attorney's office, and I'll type in the case number and I'll get a case file. And that case file will be the defendant's name. It'll be the cop that wrote it up, all that, like what happened, the body cam footage, any surveillance footage in the area, um, just everything I need to really make sure I'm writing this case correctly. Um, so then I'll see what the charges are. Now, this is the part that really like is the difference between a cop and a lawyer because cops charge was on the books and cops don't know the law. Don't care what they tell you, they don't. So they just charge what you know is on the books. So they will charge a, a felony for, let's say it'll be, I'll, it'll be a traffic stop and they'll charge like, I don't know, felony possession. Um, and then they'll also charge for speeding or whatever. I won't write the VTL charge. I'll write, I'll focus on the felony possession or I'll focus on whatever other charges they charge. And I'll see, is it correct? Is it not? Um, <clears throat> Sometimes it is, a lot of times it isn't. Uh, they're, they're thinking in the moment, I have to think down the line as an attorney. So I have to think, is this charge gonna withstand constitutional muster? Is this charge gonna withstand an aggressive defense attorney? Is this charge gonna make sense when we go to trial later? Most of the time, it's not. So then I'll have to, I'll, I'll D down the charge, I'll write what it is. That usually gets d dumbed down from um, felony to misdemeanor and I'll, then I'll write it up. Then I'll have to go get my books or go online, look up what it is, like make sure that I'm in my, right away in my head, I'm like, okay, I think this is gonna be this charge. I think this will be an assault three, even though it was a charge in assault two or whatever it was, you know, I'll think it'll be something else. And then usually I'm right. And then I'll go and then I'll start writing it up. So I'll use, you know, the legal terms and I'll write up what happened to time, place and occurrence. So-and-so happened this happened and um, the legal reasoning behind it. And then, then I'll have the case. Then I'll have to talk to the cop, interview the cop, interview the victim and <clears throat> interview any other witnesses over the phone. It used to be in person, but with COVID we're doing it over the phone now. And then I'll make sure everything's written up. Uh, I'll conference it with the supervisor and then bam, you have your case. And that's what I'll do all day long, write up cases and I'll send them up to Raymond's. The Raymond ADA will call me and the, if there's an offer, they're like, okay, A. Dave Van Air, what do you think about this offer? Good offer, bad offer, so and so. Um, and then that's what my day to day is. On the opposite end, when I'm not doing that, I'm either working on cases that I have already on my on my docket, or I'm doing I'm handling sensitive police material for the office, which is why I said my unit's very interesting because we're the discovery compliance unit. So when I'm not doing my normal uh, ADA activities. I have to make sure our office is complying with the rigorous laws of discovery that New York has, which changed in 2020. So not only were we dealing with the discovery law change, which is way more, um, we have to make sure all our, um, everything is like correct. And it's more like favorable for defense. We have to disclose everything. And we also have to disclose all police allegations um, in their personal files. So I have to go through these mountains of paperwork to make sure that we are disclosing all necessary obligations to defense and to um, the judge of what this officer did, whether they're credible or not. And if they are credible, why? And if they're not credible, then what were the charges? And what was the outcome of the CCRB investigation? Which in New York, that's the Civilian Complaint Review Board. When someone complains on an officer, they have to go um, ahead of the CCRB, Civilian Complaint Review Board, and that we need to find out whether those um, allegations were substantiated, unsubstantiated, or unfounded. So that's pretty much my day to day at, as a prosecutor in New York City. And the best part is though, I get to tell that person who I think maybe that cop who I didn't think had 
you know, the proper probable cause, or I get to tell them, yeah, you know what, we're dismissing this case. This is Recording in progress. Um, I don't know what just happened, but yeah, that's was what I was saying was I get to uh, do stuff like that. I get to tell them, yeah, these are not the proper charges where this is going to be uh, declined to prosecute. Um, or I get to give an offer that I think is really fair, um, which usually is involves some type of um, making sure that those charges are not going to stick on someone's record. We'll usually like, um, we'll drop them later. We'll do an, what's an ACD adjudicated court dismissal. Basically a contract, you stay in trouble for six months to a year, whatever, and we drop all charges and we expunge your records. And the best part was recently we legalized marijuana here three weeks ago. That was a great day for the court, great day for prosecution because we get to drop everyone's charges and expunge everyone's records. And that's my favorite thing to do is drop charges and expunge records when it's necessary. Real quick, before we move on to Zadi, Chay, I wanted to really ask you, do you, do you I was going to try and see, do you have the ability to kind of, you know, a student that comes and maybe a, a, a kid that makes a mistake or an adult that makes a mistake for one or two times, the ability to kind of just drop the case, give them a slap on the wrist and say, don't do it again. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, do you see people within your department kind of looking as you as you look to trump down charges or to or to decrease charges? Do you see people within your your department kind of trumping up charges and and being a little bit more strict or, or severe? Um, so those are really good questions. Um, the first question you asked, absolutely, we have a whole unit for that, the juvenile justice unit. Um, where that is for people who are, you know, under the age of 21, who are, you know, first or second time offenders, most people of color, I work in the Bronx specifically, it's one of the most um, black and Latino boroughs we have here. Um, my assistant, my district attorney is absolutely, she was the first black woman to ever do it in New York. Um, she was a judge for a long time. She was a prosecutor for a while. She was a defense attorney. So she's done everything. And she is very, very forward-minded. Uh, a prosecutor's worst nightmare, especially in this day and age, is putting someone away who doesn't deserve it, right? So um, what we did in the past, I'm not even gonna say we, what they did in the past is what they did. What we do now is what we do. We're definitely trying, especially, you know, trying to make our office look like people like me, you know, people who grew up in New York City. I was born and raised here. People who, you know, are people of color were trying to make it way more diverse. So yes, absolutely, <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely, we do that. As for older people though, we can even offer them things. A lot of people who are older that offend are usually on drugs. So we have a very robust restorative justice program. In fact, when I worked in the restorative justice unit for Kim Fox, I had learned that they had a meeting with uh, our, where I work now, before I even started working here to, to be able to develop that unit. Um, as for trumping up charges, so far, I mean, I'm new, I have not seen it um, for two reasons. One, we are heavily, heavily scrutinized now. It's not like it was in the past. You know, everything is, you're being watched, your work is being checked. Um, the defense is being is looking at you, making sure you're not doing things like that. We have all these things in the media, like Black Lives Matter, um, anti-police movement, anti-prosecution movement. So everything we do needs to be correct, you know? Um, the only time I would say that charges are potentially trumped up is that will be a, a state statute. If you are multiple time a, a felony offender, then we can't really do anything for you. You know, we can't really offer you uh, a plea deal. We can't really do much. We can't really, or if you have like New York, we have heavy gun laws. I mean, if you're found with an illegal gun, you're going away for two to three years minimum. I mean, and that's nothing we can do. That is a state law. So. There are some things we can't really work with, but I have not seen in my office. I mean, the DA, she won't play that. You know, like I said, like you will, not only will you lose your job, you will have to answer to the New York Bar Association about why you thought it was necessary to file charges that were not supported by law or reason. So no, I can't really say I've seen that um, so far. And I don't think that I will see it because during training, it was very, it was made very clear that um, no matter what you do, make sure you do the right thing. 
You know, if you make a mistake, that's okay. But some mistakes you can't take back. So you need to always make sure you're doing the right thing. You know, if you're doing the right thing and you make a mistake, we can work with you. But if you're not doing the, if you're hiding evidence, if you're not owning up to your mistakes, if you're trumping up charges, if you're just not working for the people, like we work for the people. When I write my complaints, the people, when I'm in court, Chave and Air for the people. And that's exactly what we do. And I take that very seriously. And I think my office does too. So no, I have not seen that. And I hope I never see it because the day I feel like I'm not doing my job or the day I feel like I'm doing something wrong or I'm like hurting somebody is the day I resign. So, thank yeah. you for that, Chair. I really appreciate the transparency as well, man. Uh, thank you. Um, and Zadi, I don't know if you, you might have forgot the question by now, but um, uh, what's your day to day like and what's the hardest part of your job and the most rewarding part? Um, so right now, currently, I'm in a very unique unit. Um, no one's day is like mine. But well, to start off, when I started at the office, I was in a courtroom unit, which is that goes very typical to everybody else's to other, other public defenders day. So I was in a felony preliminary courtroom unit. And just to give a brief overview of that, you come into work, um, you go to your um, partners, they have a stack of case files because the pandemic, that courtroom was only operating Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So instead of a typical day of having 30, 40 cases on the call, which was a lot for that time, we would have 130, 140 cases on the call. Um, there were three of us in that unit. So we split up the days. So one person got Monday, one person got Wednesday, one person got Friday. We would all take that giant stack into the courtroom. Um, I don't know if you guys know about preliminary hearings, but um, so a case in Cook County can either be indicted by, um, superseded by indictment for a grand jury or one in the preliminary courtroom, which the judge basically hears us question the officer that made the police report. We can ask them questions, um, very basic questions. Most of our questions are objected to, but basically the goal is to put things on the record so that the officer can't recant them or change their story later down the line. So we're building, helping build the case for the trial attorneys. 99% um, of felony preliminary hearings in Cook County in front of the judge that I was in front of, who was a former state's attorney, what were lost. We basically lost every felony preliminary hearing, which is not that big of a deal, honestly. It doesn't mean it's no indication of guilt. Um, and actually in Cook County before the pandemic, most cases were gun cases and most cases, most of those gun cases were indicted by a grand jury. And I don't know if you all know the saying that a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. They indict everybody. It's just what it is what it is. If you're accused of something, you you did it to the grand jury. So um, we would yeah take that case file in. We would have so many cases on the call that you had to be very quick reading the police report. And then you would go interview your client in a room, ask them, you know, I'm gonna read, I would tell them, I'm reading this police report to you. You be quiet, listen to what I'm reading. At the end, you tell me if anything's different. Most of the time, the officers obviously highly embellish stories. Not to say that all officers are bad, but for some reason, CPD loves to say that people are admitting things. I don't know who would get out and be like, yes, officer, that marijuana is in the middle console and this gun is in my pocket is mine. Apparently everybody admitted to everything. So we always had to cross-examine that. That was most of the cross-examining that I did was officer, did my client really say this? Officer, do you have this recorded on body cam footage? And then I would leave, um, court days were really, really long. Some days we didn't get out till 7 p.m. So we were in court from, I was at work from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. So many days, um, most of the time since we were three days a week, it was very, it was very hectic piling everything on at three days. Um, when I was finally made an official assistant public defender, um, like I said, which was in about September, I stayed in that unit for a few more weeks. And then in October, I was moved to my very unique position, which is in PSRU, which stands for the Police Station Representative Unit. And so our job is basically, you know, when people get arrested and they say, I want an attorney, by law, CPD has to give them the Cook County Public Defender number. Um, they give us our that they give our clients that number that client calls um, that toll free number which is 24 seven. So there are I think nine people in my unit. It's three people per shift per eight hour shift you work with one partner a day we're four days on two days off. So today is one of my off days. 
Um, basically, I work the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift. So I have a Cook County phone and I wait for that phone to ring all day. Most of the calls now are very informational. What's the Zoom court info for this courtroom, which obviously I don't know, I don't have it. Um, um, how do I get a public defender? It's very informative. Um, there are days, there are times, like times that we're in now, where if, um, so as you all know that that police cam footage for Ad Adam Toledo was released, these type of times is when our lines get very, very heavy and people are constantly calling and calling and calling back to back to back because people are getting arrested, their family members are getting arrested. Most of our calls from arrestees are from their families and not from the actual client. So um, uh, most of my calls for visits are, my boyfriend just got arrested um, an hour ago or 15 minutes ago. I don't know where he is. I call Central Booking, I say, this is the person's name. Central Booking will either tell me where this person is or they don't have him. I believe central booking most of the time, but you know, as, as a public defender, I have to have a very um, pessimistic outlook. That's the best way I can describe it um, for the other side. Um, not to say that they're bad people, but I always have to operate on, they're not giving me the right information. So I'll call around if I eventually find the person because the pandemic, most of the visits are done over the phone. I'm not going into the police station. Um, officers don't wear masks and they don't socially distance. Um, so I will not go in unless it's an emergency that requires me to be there in person, um, which I don't have a whole lot of those. Um, visits that require in-person visits all the time is if it's a minor accused of a homicide or a very violent sex crime. Um, so I'll call the station, I'll say, I know this person is in custody there. Um, I've, I've narrowed it down to this location. I need to speak with them. I have to email the sergeant on duty, my credentials, and then they eventually call me back. They don't call, I always call every 30 minutes. I'm waiting for my call, I'm waiting for my call, I'm waiting for my call because the longer your client is sitting in that room, the crazier they'll go, the more they'll want to speak. They lose hope very, very quickly, very easily. Officers are very, um, they're kind of predatorial. They jump on clients, um, especially for serious cases like, if you all know, there's a lot of carjackings going around. So cases like that, yeah, strategic, that's a good word. They're very strategic. They will leave your client in a room and um, they're waiting for that person to break down. So um, if it's high profile things like that are going on in the city, so because the carjackings are so heavy, they're hesitant to let us speak to those clients. If it's something like a trespass, they'll call me back in five minutes. Oh, you, here's your client and I'll speak to them. I hear my client declare their rights over the phone. I always tell them, I never tell them what to do. I always recommend, you know, do you want to be represented by the public defender's office as an attorney? I recommend that you say yes. It's up to you. You don't have to speak to me. 99% of the time they say yes. I say, I, I as your an attorney, um, let me know if there's an officer around you. They say yes or no. There's always an officer standing in their face listening to our phone call. I say, we have no expectation of privacy while you're in the station. My representation is the same way over the phone as it would be in person. We're not saying anything while, we're, while you're in that station. We have no expectation that they're not recording our call, that they're not recording my visit. Um, if there's an officer around you, you assert your rights. You plainly say to this officer, I have an attorney and I'm exercising my right to remain silent without my attorney present. I make sure they say all of those words. I document what time they said it in my notes. Um, if I can, I will get the officer's star numbers. A lot of the time the officers say, you don't have to say that. I hear them say, you don't have to say that to me. I'm not questioning you or I'm just a holding officer. I'm just here to watch you on the phone, but you're an officer. So if I get an officer in the station, I know that you heard my client assert his rights at 12.37 PM. That way, further down the line, if there's some confession that came and they have to document when they heard that confession. You heard that confession at 1.15. I know my client was represented at 12.37. So that's a real sticky situation. So also in PSRU, we have to document, we have to put things into eDefender, which is the public defender system for all of our clients. I have to put that in within a day or two of the visit because typically in bond court, the prosecutors, you know, they will say that, oh, this client um, confessed at this time. And if they have in their records, oh no, another public a, uh, APD Shazadi Cannon said that, you know, our client talked to her at this time. So that doesn't seem right, Judge. Um, so like very similar to my previous unit, the felony or preliminary unit, my unit is very, 
um, it's more so helping down the line. Um, every one or two, every other week, I have a client, which is the sad, the saddest cases, which are juveniles. And um, I usually have to go in for the juveniles because um, a lot of the juveniles are accused of carjackings, which I don't necessarily go in for because a lot of them have cases already. So they're sitting in the juvenile temporary detention center anyway. So I'm not gonna go in um, because they're, they don't necessarily need to question them again for another case when they're already in on another carjacking. And then typically um, the carjackings are very straightforward. The officers are looking at surveillance footage Families are there already, so I know that my client is not really gonna, it's not really at harm. Um, with certain districts and certain stations, officers harass the parents, or they will talk to our clients anyway and forget the Declaration of Rights. They go completely off the book. They do whatever, they, they will do illegal tactics to get what they want. And in those cases, I will go in, um, even if it's not necessary, not necessary. Um, I have had, um, I have to, had to go in for juveniles accused of murder, which is always very sad when you're sitting across from a 13 year old and you say, okay, I'm here because you're accused of a homicide. And one of my clients was like, was just sitting there, like he was unfazed. And I looked at his mom, like, you know, his mom is bawling and I'm like, okay, why is your son not reacting? And she was like, he doesn't even know what that word means. So these kids, those are the saddest cases when you're telling a child what they're accused of and they have no idea because not only are these kids not in school right now, they have nothing occupying their time. They're from low income neighborhoods that don't even um, educate them to the standard that, that they need to be educated to. Um, they don't have high, um, they don't have um, high vocabulary. They don't really know what the, they don't know anything that's going on. I've had to go in on children on a 12 year old last week that was accused of criminal sexual assault. It's like, he had no idea what was going on. He just kept looking at his mom like, am I being arrested? Can I play my game? Like it was just, it's just, those are the cases that are sad. And those are the cases where I come home and I cry because I feel like I'm not doing anything. Like I wish I could sit in the station with him all day and just tell him it's gonna be okay. I wish I could like go talk to his mom and text his mom every day what's happening, but I can't do it because I have other clients and, you know, that's not necessarily, um, I'm not in a position to cater to every single one of my clients, but the saddest cases are definitely, the saddest and most interesting are the cases where it's juveniles and they're accused of these like higher profile crimes that it's just like, how could a child even formulate the strategy to do something like that? that's when it becomes sad because me and the parents are sitting there, you know, stressed. Obviously I can't show my emotion, but we're sitting there like I'm stressed. I know that she's stressed. She's showing me that she's stressed and the officers are just hunky dory and they're just like, well, okay, we're just going to stay track with our state's attorney. And you're sitting in that room for sometimes an hour, two hours, because I'm not going to leave my clients just with an officer, you know? So I commend someone like Che who takes his job very seriously and he takes pride in his position because um, it is like he said, state attorneys and public defenders are not necessarily enemies, but I have worked alongside state attorneys that don't care. They will say anything to a judge because they know that that judge is on their side. They will say that my client definitively did something. They know they did it. They know that the judge is going to believe them and they just have no integrity. They're just trying to get through the call. They're just trying to do what they're being paid to do. They have no remorse for the people or individual situations. So I appreciate the work that you're doing, Che. That's awesome. Uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, Hazadi. Um, I, I can only imagine how, how difficult some of those cases can be. And I'm pretty sure you're underpaid and overworked. So um, continue to do great things. And again, I, I cherish the fact that, you know, you and Che are both doing doing public interest. Um, Attorney Allen, um, I, I see you're back. Uh, quickly, could you just talk to us about what your day-to-day -day is like and, and you know the hardest and most rewardful part of your job? Oh, sure. Uh, my day-to-day -day is uh, it's pretty hectic. It's, uh, it's long, uh, but uh, you know, I'm working for myself, so that kind of comes with the territory. Um, but uh, so my day usually starts, I'm in court, uh, when it's not pandemic time every single day. So I'll describe non-pandemic days. 
Um, I, I usually start court at around nine. And then I will have between the criminal and the uh, civil rights cases, usually about, I would say an average of five to 10 cases a day. Um, and in Cook County, I would be going from different courthouses in the county, sometimes different counties, DuPage, Will, different collar counties. Uh, more often than not, I'm dealing with uh, status dates. So between about, uh, I would say from nine to one, I'm in court dealing with, uh, dealing with clients, dealing with status aides, dealing with uh, other minor issues that I can resolve quickly in court. Um, then in the afternoon uh, is um, uh, office time uh, where I would uh, have clients come to the office, meet new clients, um, uh, have clients come to prep for trials, juries, other hearings I may have. Um, and then um, uh, after that time, <laughs> that office time, then office time after that is for me to uh, prepare uh, written motions, uh, do legal research, um, uh, and that sort of thing. And then every Saturday, what I do is um, Saturdays are for me for uh, business development and, and for um, uh, researching new topics, something that I'm not uh, as familiar with that I, as, as I would like to be. Maybe something came up during the week and I didn't know it as well as I thought I should have. I use Saturdays to uh, to research that. Um, so the days, my you know, most of my days usually don't end to around between eight and ten p.m. Um, and it's just just to kind of uh, keep up with what's going on. Um, but it, it's all worth it because it's my it's my old practice. So every all the sweat equity I'm putting in, I, I you know, I see the results. Um, the, I think one of the most challenging things uh, for this practice, especially the civil rights work is um, seeing how callous and how, uh, unfortunately, uh, I have a very cynical view of the Chicago police. I have a very cynical view of a lot of police departments. Um, uh, and when I see uh, all the atrocities that are occurring and, and people are seeing now finally in, in public view, I've been, you know, I've seen, I've seen these things my entire career, um, you know, so mo most times when people have conversations with me about police, uh, they usually walk away feeling um, kind of sad because, because I'm just, I'm just very honest about it and that, you know, it's, issues aren't training and all these other nonsense other people are talking about. Honestly, things need to just be torn down and rebuilt. Um, so um, that's the hard part. But uh, the rewarding part is, you know, when you know, I just had a client I uh, that was wrongfully uh, arrested and charged with a, a armed robbery. I represented him on a criminal case, and uh, I won a jury trial. And then, I, then I turned around and sued the city, and we got a a, a, a pretty big settlement. So. Um, and then, after, but after that, he's a young guy, so I, I hook him up with the financial advisor, you know, and I'm still talking to him, you know, to make sure he's still in the right direction with his money. And he's, you know, we still talk, he's a young guy. And so th those are the things that, you know, I feel good about this, this guy, this kid, he was arrested for literally just walking out of his house. He was walking out of his house. It's, and it sounds very cliche. He had just got done, his family. His father's a, a pastor. They had just got done read the Bible. You could, and he walked out the house, walked out the front door, and he fit the description. Got arrested for armed robbery. Spent a lot of time in jail, and he absolutely didn't do it. Um, so uh, to have all that work out um, is a good feeling, but it's just unfortunate that it has to happen. So yeah. Thank you so much for that, and thanks to all of our panelists for the incredible sort of insight into what your day-to-day -day is like, because I really feel like those things aren't, aren't portrayed as to, you know, the things you go through each and every day. So I know we're in the last five minutes here. We always like to end with just advice you would give to law students or pre-law students who are interested in, in this sort of line of work, whether that be civil rights, public interest, criminal defense, government work. Um, but I do just want to ask quickly if there's any questions from the attendees today, because um, I want to make sure we get our questions answered as well. So does anyone right out of the gate have any questions? Ashley. Uh, 
go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ashley, and I'm a 1L student it's finishing my first year, so I'm excited about that. Um, but I am right now in between two internships for the summer, um, one being a civil rights internship with the Center for Law and Social Justice in New York, um, which works with the I mean, against the disenfranchisement of Black people specifically, and the other with the DuPage State's Attorney's Office. And they're both fully aware that I will be um, working with both groups over the summer. Um, but one of the things that happened was during my interview process, I interviewed very unapologetically saying, this is what I believe in. Um, I'm pro-Black lives, you know, um, and giving all this information. But I realized that there are stigmas that go with being you know a prosecutor but there are also stigmas that go along with for example being a defense attorney as well so how do you overcome those stigmas in the black community or how do you um approach people i guess or respond to them when they may want to say you know you're not really doing anything for the people um i'm just going to jump in quick <clears throat> excuse me um i think you have great opportunities ahead of you and um that's really awesome to have as one else so good for you um, as for his stigmas, um, you're never going to really overcome them. You kind of just learn to live with them. Uh, I would say be careful sometimes what you divulge in an interview. Um, now I'm not saying you completely need to censor yourself, but I also am saying that um, not everybody always needs to know your personal views in an interview. Um, but in terms of like the stigmas, just being yourself and believing in, you know, knowing what you believe in and sticking by your convictions is like kind of my advice to you. Um, as a black woman, you know, you're always gonna have, you're gonna go through life with many different stigmas and you're gonna go through life being judged a certain way. And I think um, Zadi can kind of speak more to that than me because I'm obviously not a black woman, but I do know how it is to be a person of color. So um, I would say that try to pay them no mind and try not to like second guess yourself and but always know that you know it is a profession, no matter whether it's um, public defense or whether it's prosecution or whether it's civil rights. You know, so you might want to just try to avoid always being as um, unapologetic. I'm not saying I want you want you to not be you, but the legal profession is still heavily you know um, dominated by white men. So just keep that in mind moving forward. That's kind of my quick little spiel there. Quickly, I would just say that I think because I'm, I'm new to the office still, it actually still does bother me that people feel like public defenders aren't real lawyers. And it's just like, I, I sometimes I experience and I'm just thinking like, okay, you know, I, I went to law school, I passed the bar, I, I'm excellent at my job. I know that I'm intelligent. I know that I've put in just as much work as the private attorneys you know, but I will, it's likely that as a public defender, I'll never get that respect from 100% of the, the clients. And like Chase said, I, I know that I'm going to have to just accept that at some point, but it does bother me when people answer the phone, calling me, asking me for help, like, okay, I need a free attorney. Okay, but I want an attorney, not a public defender, you know, that's disrespectful. And you're asking me for help. And sometimes I want to jump out of that professionalism and, you know, be unapologetic and be myself because my calls are not recorded. So I really could just say anything to you on this phone right now. But I have to remember that, you know, I am the professional and that there are stigmas that are attached to being a criminal, not only just a public defender, but a criminal defense attorney. There are stigmas attached to that and I have to always keep that in mind and remember that some people just need a little bit of educating and not to say don't be unapologetic sometimes but understand that not everybody needs you to educate them all the time some people are far past that point some people are past the point of you explaining yourself to them or defending your views or your job choices to them you have to just be yourself and be prideful in what you're doing and understand that you're doing the work that you feel like is best for you and your people and just keep that in mind. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, DuPage, I don't know if you're from um, Chicago or the Chicagoland area, uh, but DuPage is a very conservative area. So um, if I were you, I would think hard about working there. <laughs> It, de it depends on, I mean, it depends on what kind of person you are. When I was at State Story's office, I mean, I went, I mean, I'm from, I'm from Roseland. 
I went to HBCU for undergrad. Uh, so honestly, that was really my first time around uh, folk who weren't black. So, so I, I still just say, I, they, people said crazy things to me. I said crazy things back. Um, so, you know, I lasted five and a half years. I didn't have, I didn't have any disciplinary issues, but there were some, there were some serious arguments. Um, oh, I see she says she's from DuPage. Okay. So you, you know what, you know what you're walking into. Um, they're going to be people with a lot of conservative views. You're going to hear a lot of things that uh, might bother you. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing to think about. Uh, but I just always say, you know, be, be polite, but be firm, you know? And, and be yourself, and I think you'll be fine. Thank you all. Thanks for the question, Ashley. I know we are out of time. Um, <clears throat> so I, I won't ask, I, I don't know how much time all of you have. I know Attorney Allen is, is in the car ready to get out of the parking lot, I'm assuming, from court. Um, so I won't keep you all too much longer. Um, if you could just, briefly like 10 15 seconds of advice you have for students who are looking to enter this career path that would be greatly appreciated um we can start with attorney allen yes what was the question i'm sorry i was uh, distracted you're fine um just advice quick advice you have for students who uh, may be interested in entering you know the same sector that you're in um oh. and through their law school career and beyond sure uh I would say then um, while you're in law school, I find that more often than not where you clerk or what kind of work you do when you clerk, that's what you end up doing when you get out. So if you want to do public interest work, uh, be sure to uh, clerk there, but not just for summers, you can also do it you know, during the school year. A lot of them, they'll take you uh, during the school, because then, I mean, honestly, they're not paying you more, more often than not. So they'll take your work during the school year too. And it's a great, great opportunity because uh, they will just throw you in the courtroom and you, you will learn, you will learn a lot. Um, at this point in my career, I literally, literally have done hundreds, if not probably close to over a thousand trials. And it's just from uh, my time uh, being in the court as a prosecutor and being in court as a criminal defense attorney. And that, in my opinion, that's where you really, you know, uh, learn the law. You know, it's fine, you know, writing briefs and, and, and writing is, is great and it's an important skill, but the courtroom work is where you get it. So just uh, do those internships and um, so you can get a good uh, idea of what you uh, are getting yourself into. And um, uh, and uh, that's about it. That's about it. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Um, che, do you have any advice for students? Yeah, similar to what Attorney Allen said, um, when you're in law school, take full advantage of just like the externships you get and internships you get. And um, you don't like, you're there for three years. So if you wanna do civil work one year, if you wanna do criminal defense another year and you, your last year you wanna do prosecution, then, you know, that's something you can do. You know, you can um, talk to those professors that, you know, that are you're in those subjects you're interested in. You know, they'll know people, um, they'll know they'll have good advice. And the most important thing I had, would have to say is you need to find something like a circle. Like you need to find people that you can trust because there were days when I just woke up and I didn't want to do it anymore. You know, there were days where I didn't feel like, you know, I could do it anymore. And that circle really kept me in line and kept me, you know, and always remember, the last thing is always remember why you're there. Always remember your goal. Like always remember that you're here to become an attorney and nothing will stop you. And if you keep that in mind, then you'll become an attorney. You know, I look back, I just graduated recently and I felt like, like you blink, you're in one L. You blink again, you're in three L and you're like, oh my God, where'd the time go? You blink, you're sitting for the bar, you blink again and you're, you're being sworn in. So it's like, it's so fast and so fast, but it's such a long, hard road. But to be honest, like there's no profession that's more rewarding than like, you know, doing what you want to do, you know, loving your job. And I went to school with Zadi and she's fire. And honestly, like, she's such a good attorney. Like she helped me with sometimes in class when I needed it. So I'm so happy that she's able, you know, she's working for the public defender's office and just John Marshall, just all law schools, but specifically UIC, like 
puts out really good lawyers. So make sure you know, meet people and make sure, I know it's hard over Zoom. I really hope you guys, you know, um, get back in club person, but by you being here, like you're taking initiative. So just remember that. Great, thank you. Um, last but not least, Zadi, any advice for, for future PD? Thanks, Che, you know, it's all love over here. Um, but I think that my three most important tips, honestly, to law students is always, um, don't let law school take you out. It's stressful. It's going to feel like you can't do it anymore. Everybody, no matter how much encouragement you have around you, no matter how much of a positive and zen person you are, there's going to be at least 30 seconds at some point in your law school career where you feel like I'm not doing this, this anymore. I'm dropping out. It's over with. I'm done. Forget the student debt. I don't care. I'm going. Everybody's going to have that point. But over, don't let that take you over. Don't let that win. And you can't let law, like law school is, is made. I think that law school is made to, fit, to fish out the weak people. You're not one of those weak people. It's not going to take you out. Um, second, don't compare yourself to others. Law school is, you know, it's rankings, it's grades. Those things are important. I would never say that grades are not important, but understand that your path is your path and you're going to get a job when you graduate. I don't care if you're ranked one or 150, you're going to get a job. What others do and how much money they're making and what path they're doing and what their dream job is, is not relevant to you. You understand that you're in law school, that's an amazing accomplishment. When you graduate law school, that's an amazing accomplishment. You pass the bar, that's an amazing accomplishment, regardless of what the other people around you are doing. And you're great because you've done what you set your mind out, what you set yourself out to do. So that's great on its own. And then I think my third piece of advice would be to do and to work for exactly what you want to work for, no matter what the stigma is around it, no matter what the statistics are. I know that my dream job is to be an Illinois Supreme Court justice. What's everybody asked me, there were people who told me the likelihood of me being a Supreme Court justice, not going to a highly ranked school, going to UIC John Marshall and not being ranked in the top one third of my class, what's the likelihood that I would accomplish it? accomplish that there were people there were there was a black boy who was my friend who told me that who was my friend who was supposedly my friend that told me that 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 would not happen for me because I wasn't good enough to do that and I didn't even go to a school that had the name that would allow me to do that but you know what I'm going to do anyway I'm going to work to be an Illinois Supreme Court justice because I know that that's what I want to do with my life so no matter what you want to do you work towards it and you do everything you can so that even by some random low chance that you don't get to do what your dream was, you know that you did everything you could to work towards it. And you didn't get it because maybe it just wasn't for you because that wasn't on your path. You didn't get it not because you didn't have the name behind you, but it just maybe wasn't your path and you were made to do something greater than that. And I think that those are my, that's my most important advice. Um, and just a little, just a little note Another piece of advice I would say is that money isn't everything. I know that money is important. And I think that I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with my salary at the public defender's office. Of course, I would love my salary to be a million dollars. It's not, and I, but I'm okay because I know that um, the work that I'm doing makes up for um, whatever they're paying me. And that eventually I'll work my way up to a point where I can sustain a life, a life of luxury and own a yacht and a large mansion and have 70 kids running around. I love Thank you, Zadi. I, um, would, would you mind sharing your uh, email? I, awesome. So I've, um, I see Shay puts his in there and attorney Allen put their emails. Thanks, Zadi's about to throw her email in as well. Perfect. Um, so I will also email out their contact information after this. Um, you know, I think this session was so important today because I always say, um, and. Che mentioned it, Zadi mentioned it, Attorney Allen mentioned it, they all did, you know, when you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And so that's the goal, no matter what that looks like for you. And I think it's key and it's huge, especially for those who do such great work in public interest. So Thank you all so much to our incredible panel for joining us for the season two finale. I don't think there was a better way to end it than with all of you extremely dedicated professionals who are just doing such amazing work. So we thank you one for your work and two for joining us this morning. Um, enjoy your weekend and, and thank you again. We really appreciate it. And thanks so much to our attendees for coming as well. Thank Take you care.